Um, so good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, what is the closing keynote for Open Research Week 2024. This is our seventh event. Um, my name is Catherine Steffen, and I'm one of the co-organizers of Open Research Week 2024. Um, you're welcome to keep your camera on, but please mute yourself throughout the session. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on the chat, so please feel free to put any questions in there if time allows, and we will ask after the talks. Um, closed, captioned are, closed captions are enabled for this talk. If you would like captioning, please click on the three dots under more, then language and speech, and then turn on live captions. The Open Research Week team is committed to providing a friendly, respectful, and welcoming environment for everyone and for, for all, and to ensure a harassment-free experience for everyone, we request that participants be treated with respect and dignity. Today's session is facilitated by Dr. Rashan Reeder and Dr. Lukia Tavella, University of Liverpool, with talks and a discussion from Dr. Andrew Jones, Liverpool John Moores University, Dr. Maddie Pownall, University of Leeds, and Dr. Tetsuya Amano, the University of Queensland. Please welcome Dr. Komain Ralibitso, Senior, Associate Dean, Diversity and Inclusion from the Faculty of Science and Senior Lecturer of Microbial Microbial Ecology, Ecology. Liverpool, jo bon yeah, Liverpool John Moores University, who is here to officially close Open Research Week 2024. Over to you, Komeng. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Catherine and, and Kath, for inviting me uh, to close this ceremony. So we're happily going to do our presentation back to front. Um, so uh, Catherine has already introduced me, so I will not uh, belabor that, that point. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm probably speaking, uh, preaching to the converted here. Uh, we all know about equity uh, and the difference between equity and equality and then diversity and inclusion. And of course, today uh, or to end this week, we're positioning that very much within uh, the environment of science. I thought uh, I, would, I would position my uh, closing keynote uh, within the context of our intent, really, uh, is to ensure pursuance and development of knowledge that are fit. Uh, and probably some of us are already aware of what uh, fit means within this context. Um, but overall, diversity and inclusion is absolutely central to all disciplines uh, that, that we uh, pursue and that uh, we, we develop uh, as, as uh, uh, academics and, and researchers uh, in, in different spheres uh, of, of the range of disciplines that we that we study. Uh, I'll keep saying science because that's, that's my home, uh, but that's not in to intentionally exclude anybody uh, and the other disciplines represented here. So FIT stands for fair, inclusive or representative uh, and transparent. I've used here examples of uh, an existing uh, program that we have just uh, established uh, within the Forensic Research Institute in Liverpool, John Walsh University, where we're looking at how we can make forensic science in its entirety as inclusive as possible. So we're going to train, for example, uh, six uh, PhD students and all of their research is underpinned uh, by inclusivity and, uh, and diversity. The work that I do is within forensic science uh, as regards the human microbiome. As humans, we are however many billions we are approaching at the moment, so that diversity has to be as uh, included and represented as much as we possibly can. Digital forensics and AI are, are and, you know, at the forefront uh, of all debates at the moment. Um, so some of the research that we're looking into uh, as funded by Liverpool John Moss University is how we can train our facial recognition models uh, using a, 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 a representative uh, a cohort uh, of, of individuals. So about uh, open science, uh, Henrietta Lacks again uh, is, is making news um, uh, uh, very recently. If open science had been practiced, practiced from the beginning around uh, Henrietta Lacks, ethical conduct would have been assured, along with that fairness, inclusivity, and importantly, transparency. Whenever we exercise fitness within science and op you know, open science, we avoid and mitigate against uh, negative inhumane legacies such as that uh, of, of Henrietta. Imagine the dignity and the pride that uh, her and her family would have enjoyed if she had been asked, Henrietta, you have this unique cancer. Uh, we'd like to collect your cells uh, to then use them in what we'll call the HALA cell line. It will be used here in the States and all over the world. I bet you could manage, she would have said yes. And she would have said, I suffer this disease. I want the research to be done. I want my family to be recognized. 
Um, and then she would have had that dignity and pride to know that she's making a difference. Uh, and then the cancer research that would be done would hopefully improve the lives of so many around the world. Is open science good or openness in science good? It is good, obviously, because it ensures an exchange of ideas that is current. There's progress at pace. No scientist gets left behind. No ideas or recognition are excluded and contribution uh, to current uh, and also benefiting from those current trends and inputs is shared by all. I've had the honor and the opportunity to work in different parts uh, of the world, different laboratories of different uh, wealth, uh, if you like, or poverty, uh, and seen the difference in access to publications, especially current uh, science and current publications. Openness is good, of course, in science because it ensures that we have uh, there's open access, not just by scientists and researchers, but also by members of the public. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, hopefully assuring and ensuring this openness and, and include inclusion of um, uh, stakeholders even more. Uh, and increasingly, the research calls that go out there uh, include an element of how is this going to benefit society directly, but also the ethics and the inclusivity, how is that assured from the beginning? The makeup of the team, how diverse and inclusive are they? There's a good and timely reflection on harnessing and maximizing on indigenous knowledge to ensure that inclusivity and transparency. I've included here uh, one of our shining stars from Southern Africa, Professor Mamukheti Paking, who was uh, the former Vice Chancellor of University uh, of Cape Town. And her language is mathematics and her teaching and passion is mathematics. And she said, South Africa has 11 official languages. Why is teaching, particularly in mathematics, only being done in English? So some some good probing uh, thoughts and debates are already out there. Open science uh, is, is, is good or aiming for that. At the moment, costs for publications can be quite prohibitive, excluding science and scientists from what are designated poor labs. And often these are the global south. That means that their voice is minimized. And one of the talks uh, later today is about just that, uh, as well as uh, the other talks reflecting on how we can ensure inclusivity, even as we train our PGRs and, and undergraduates indeed. Um, publishers and journals probably need to be forced, if it comes to it, uh, to, to, to um, ensure that they are inclusive. Often journals that are targeted that do not pay uh, or do, that do not charge publication fees are seen as low impact as publishing poor science. How do we address uh, that, that, that issue? Yes, open science is good again, uh, and more funding skills where locals or indigenous people are equal partners and co-creators uh, throughout the life of the project is another strand uh, that is being uh, introduced uh, and enforced by different uh, funding bodies uh, around the world and most definitely here uh, in, the, in the UK. The double anonymous peer review um, is, is, is an excellent approach to ensure that the publications that are being peer reviewed at submission point, are, there's anonymity, there's transparency, there's evenness. We're judging the quality of the signs, not the names or the affiliations uh, of the scientists behind the work. And one of the major funders here in the UK has already adopted this uh, DARP uh, uh, strategy. Very quickly, that's how to find me, but just, you know, Google me via LGMU, you'll find me. And I'd now like to hand over to Rishen uh, and thank you all for your for your uh, patience uh, and for inviting me. Many thanks. Over to you, Rishen. Thank you so much for that very powerful opening uh, and introduction to this session. Um, I'm really excited to introduce the three speakers that we have today who all have very diverse experiences with uh, how to make open science more inclusive and uh, equal and diverse. So uh, first of all, uh, we have Dr. Andy Jones, who is a senior lecturer in psychology at John Moores University. So not only does he publish prolifically on topics such as substance use and abuse, psychopathology and statistics, but he has also recently been involved in a large collaborative study on pre-registration of undergraduate dissertations, along with another one of our speakers today, 
Matty Powell, among many others. Um, and we asked Andy to speak today because he really exemplifies how to be a mindful and inclusive principal investigator on open research projects for early career researchers. So, um, yes, please join me in welcoming Andy Jones, uh, who is our first speaker today. So you can take it away, Andy. Oh, nice one. That was a lovely introduction. And I, I will say it's Maddie that deserves all the credit for that um, pre-registration undergrad study. But um got a couple of slides, so I'll um, go through them. Hopefully everyone can share, see my screen. Uh, it's not true. All right, then. So um, my talk is on how to be an inclusive and inspiring supervisor and principal investigator. Um, I had to think probably too too long and hard about what I actually do as a supervisor or principal investigator because I don't think it's the same for every person who I supervise or is, is involved in the, the teams I work in. But one thing that that comes across in all of them, and I, I stole this actually from uh, John Moore's website, I think, is my role should be the education and training of junior staff and students to ensure quality and integrity of research. And that, that quote fits in perfectly for this, because when we think about open research and open science, we think about um, quality and integrity, right? So we need to be ensuring and training uh, skills and tools that promotes quality and integrity. Um, and I also wanted to put in a little bit about inclusivity as well, given the nature of the, the topic. Um, so hi, um, my first part of call for this talk was to email previous PhD students and people who I've worked with and ask them, um, how did I inspire you? And it turns out I'm not very inspiring at all. Um, and the reason for this is, for the most part, I um, I do open science by default. Um, so it's over time I become normative for me. And that means when I am working with their PhD students and members of the lab, it becomes a normative thing for them. And I think that's the way open science will become mainstream for a start. And I like this quote here that open science is the by default model for conducting scientific research. I don't fully agree with the quote because I think it's a bit too soon to say that because I don't think it is fully taken up by everyone yet, but we're moving towards it being the by default model. And really it should have always been the by default model. Um, so in order to kind of help um, students and people you work with, I think make it part of the, no the norm for what you do. It's easier in psychology than some studies and I know, and I know that, but it's pretty straightforward for, for us to pre-register what we do, to share code and be transparent, but also make a part of our education as well. So before, um, students and early career researchers even get to um, PhD and postdoc, it should be embedded into undergraduate curriculums um, that this is how science should work. Um, science shouldn't be a competitive process, it should be a collaborative process. And the, comp the competitive parts of science, I think, of what have um, caused things like the replication crisis and stuff. So we need to shift the kind of culture and move it towards open science as by default. Also, I'm very aware that I didn't um, get my first kind of PI position and then suddenly became the, a person who uses open research. I benefited from open practices, so I was taught it. Um, so my experience, um, I should pass on. We should be passing on uh, the more positive part of science and using that to lift others around us. Um, and then finally, one thing I do do is to ask early. So when people start in my um, lab, I'll ask them, because mostly what we do is we have a short and long-term plan for research, right? Within a PhD project or within like a, a grant, and we, we set out plans and milestones for studies and what we want to see and do. But you should always be, you also should also be thinking about the kind of barriers that might stop you doing them in the most open way possible. Because if you know the barriers in advance, you can kind of be a bit more proactive about um, jumping over them barriers or smashing through them. So there's, there is a lot of barriers um, or a lot of perceived barriers to open science. And some of these are more, um, 
early career researchers are impacted by these more than others. So some of them are things like the fear of being scooped. So if you're open prior to publishing a study, is someone going to steal your idea and get there before you? A lack of, of awareness and training, and that's, I guess, that's um, the nature of it not be, it not currently being mainstream. Like if you join a lab who don't currently practice open science or open research, then it's very rare you're going to get the training for it. And another one, which is a genuine one, um, fear of retribution and embarrassment. Um, if you publish something that maybe senior people who might have an impact on your career um, or disagree with or they disagree with you, that you can feel like that is uh, going to negatively affect your career moving forward. And what might the role of equality, diversity and inclusion play in this? Um, this I like this killing camp. Klinghammer paper from 2022 and this quote that it should equality, diversity and inclusion should play a central role in the adoption of um, open science. But unfortunately, it, in, under current circumstances, we've got equity that gaps right. Um, I'm not going to speak too much on the kind of things like gender because I know Maddie's published on on this and she's a, a much more equipped to talk about it than I am. But there's certain groups and gaps that um, it, it's harder for them to implement open science practices. So obviously I've mentioned career stage. It's easier for me to um, commit to a lot of open science practices because I'm hopefully in a relatively secure post. I don't really have the fear of, um, you know, more established researchers coming down on me because I disagree with them. But even things that we don't usually think about, like location, um, there's more data governance and things like the EU and stuff. Sometimes it's harder for us to share data. Specific institutions, so more re institutions with more resources and maybe research intensive universities are probably more equipped to support um, open science practices. And then language as well, which the um, the keynote mentioned that um, you're already at an advantage if, if English is your first language because, you know, most open science stuff is in English. But there's been talk about uh, Openness is a somewhat exclusive field, which is the, the antithesis of what openness should be, right? And I, the irony is not lost on me as a white middle class man um, giving a presentation about um, EDI at the moment. So I appreciate you sticking with me, but I'd like you all to know that even through reading this, I've, I've it's opened my eyes further to EDI. So it's, it's helped me in things that would have in the past I'd not thought about from my privileged position. But for the most part, um, white middle class men are more likely to get funding. And this has an impact on how much you can do open research, right? Because if you've got the resources, there's a lot of invisible intensive labour that can go in to making things open. And um, think about preparing code, preparing things like preprints and stuff. All that is time intensive. And if you don't have um, the, the resources to do that, there's a chance you'll get left behind. So they... Having open science and open research as being more research intensive can potentially widen the gap right where science is already dominated by certain groups. Them groups have the resources, so the gap just widens and widens. But even about the research we do, so um, I've been guilty of this in the past. Uh, I use a lot of um, opportunity samples, so I do a lot, of, like Rochelle said, on um, alcohol consumption. And students are greater um, alcohol con consuming alcohol, right? But most of the students in the UK fit into this weird demographic. So the majority of them are white, educated, so on and so forth. So I'm not being particularly inclusive by studying we in samples. And we need to move beyond this to think about, you know, th these aren't the only people that exist. And an interesting uh, point here is, as psychology was going through the replication crisis, one of the issues is, um, even when them, there was a hundred studies trying to replicate uh, scientific research, people looked at it this, from this an inter intersectional perspective and really none of these kind of equity gaps were addressed at all. It's not just individual researchers, but journals per, per, can also perpetuate things. So journal editors are largely um, of a very closed um Homogene, homogeneous group. We see higher rejection rates for underrepresented groups um, 
these groups don't often sit on journal articles. This leads to poor career progression, which in turn means you are less likely to become a journal editor. So there's a cycle of these things that we need to try and break with increased um, EDI. But back to how to um, yeah, get your um, students more involved in open science and open research. So one thing is we often talk about it as binary, as an all or nothing approach, and it really shouldn't be, because if we do that, you're either open or you're not open, even if you're trying to be open, and that can discourage you from moving forward. So I really like the idea of this open science buffet where there's, an awful, there's a lot of tactics we can use to try and be more open. Um, even if you can't use all of them, pick some of them and try them out, see how well they work for you. So the original paper on this suggests you try and find a single entry point and um, that makes you a little bit more open. Share that and highlight it with others. Others then use that, find their own entry point, and then it, it proliferates from there, right? And the idea is that, you know, there's an awful lot of science and scientists out there. So even if we all just take one small step, cumulatively, cumulatively that has a big impact. So don't worry, what, some of my advice would be don't worry that you're not doing everything open. If you can do something open, um, that's great. And this is just a point um, that highlights this of different ways you can be open. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this, but part of it, the uh, all open or closed thing is that it's difficult because we don't, not every project's the same, right? So you can't do every single open science um, tactic in every project because it just doesn't work like that. So you have to do what you can do and be happy with that. So an example from my previous research is much of my research data from around 2015 isn't open. Uh, and that was me being very reactive when I wrote things like app uh, um, ethics applications and stuff. So I'm aware that I guess the open science movement and the open research movement has been around well before 2015, but it became mainstream in around 2011, I think. It still took me four or five years to think about data sharing in this case. So a lot of my research is locked because when I was writing ethics applications, I wasn't considering that I might need to share the research. So my workaround for this is to create synthetic data sets. So all, all the data I can um, share is pre-2015, pre the synthetic versions of it online now. And I'm not going to talk too much about this either because I'm aware I'm running out of time, but also this was um, covered quite nicely yesterday. So if you're interested in how to create synthetic data sets, um, Christoph um, spoke about it in yesterday's session. I wanted to end on a couple of things of what not to do to encourage openness. Uh, one is not to do what the Environmental Research and Public Health Journal did, which was um, limit the free papers, um, so where you don't have to pay to publish your paper in that area, to scholars from developed countries rather than developing countries. So this was um, um, went on for a while uh, on the Twitter space, I think, and the idea was as part of becoming the editor team for this, you could invite people to submit to the journal and there were some waivers uh, in order to, you know, allow people to publish. But the journal didn't allow waivers from the developing countries where these waivers would be much more likely, right? Because developed countries, universities usually have more cash to pay for things like these um, open access fees. But this journal um, suggested that developed countries have more abundant scientific research resources experience and article yield for um, and basically would increase their impact more. Um, so they were really restrictive. And essentially the quote is they um, open science for the few is just the extension of the privilege in this case from being from a developed country and probably having more resources available to you. You also don't want to be a bro, a bro open science. Uh, again, this, this came about on Twitter and it's not um, largely men um although there's quite quite a few of them um but the the argument for broken science was that even the open science community is not particularly diverse um or at least it wasn't at the time this was going on um and it was less diverse than science as a whole and that's because again um the the people, and um, let's say the white men in this case, are at an advantage because they get more grants, so they can commit a lot more time to just focusing on things like open science and stuff. 
So you can see here this um, this paper looked at the number of articles um, or about open science written by gender, and it's it's highly skewed towards men. Um, the the people who wrote this are clear that it's not just men, and the bro part of it should be identified by hate by behaviour and attitude. But the, what it is is it's um, it's a person who is consent con condescending, forthright, aggressive, overpowering. And has a tendency for inclusion, exclusion. And the, I, I um, stopped using Twitter partly because I think it's a it's a mess for science communication. But you could see at times, um, if people made a mistake in a paper or whatever, there was a massive pile on. And I think stuff like that really discourages people from doing open science and 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 being visible by it because there's always that fear of you've got something wrong, um, you're going to get piled on. So, um, what? Well, how would I inspire open research in EDI? Um, well, start as early as possible, and make. I suggest trying to make it the default if you can. Obviously, it's not a one size fits all approach, and it works for me as a psychologist, where there's a lot of tools able for me to be as open as possible. Um, obviously, if you're working with, working with things like sensitive data and stuff, it's a lot more difficult. Um, also, just. Just be open about we're human and, and we make mistakes and sometimes it's you learn more by making a mistake than not making a mistake uh, and i think i've stole one of maddie's quotes here to say we should normalize the humanness of research and um, we shouldn't be we shouldn't fear making mistakes because that's the best way we learn we should we should embrace open educational resources so this is a plug for ukrn which has an excellent website with an awful lot of educational resources available to it um, and when we are trying to inspire open research, we need to consider EDI as part of this. And we shouldn't have open research as a, a toxic, toxic feedback loop where it basically works for as a small, well, not a small group of people, pe people like me who are in a privileged position can do more open research because essentially that de-incentivizes de minorities from taking part part and widens potential gaps further and we don't want that um, and I will just leave with this really nice quote um, about EDI and, and um, I won't read it out because I'm already bumbling because I feel like I'm past time but I'll leave it up on the screen um, for a couple of seconds and if there's any questions I can take them. Wonderful Andy thank you so much for that talk yep <laughs> um okay. does does anybody have any questions uh for andy if you um I, I guess if you want to raise your little uh emoji hand uh to sort of distinguish yourself if you have a pressing question Seeing anybody yet? Um, all right. So if if people are still sort of um, uh, collecting their their thoughts for oh okay, so Kia has a question actually. So uh, all right, Lucia. Hi. Um, I guess my question for Andy is how do you deal when people raise concerns about doing open science? Because uh, a lot of the times, I think especially women in academia are feeling a little bit intimidated by um supervisors when open science is by default so they feel like because you're in a position of power and you know what you're doing you have this expertise i have to listen to you uh so i might not be able to share my concerns about oh i don't know how to do this or i think i need this takes too much time maybe it's not the best thing for my career or any type of concerns that i might have um has this happened to you um in any case i mean that's a that's an, a really good point um like I said in the in the talk, I'm the kind of research I do the it's e it's very easy to implement the open science practices. Okay, it's a little bit me more research and re resource intensive, and for the most part, I think m most of the people I've supervised have kind of been on board with it because what my my emphasis is always on it's it's you should think about this in the long term. O open science and open research isn't a fad that's going to go away. It will become the norm, um, and you kind of, you kind of don't want to get left behind. But at the same time, you, like if you if you turn to the PhD with me, I'm not going to force everything on you. 
you pick what what you think might be most beneficial for you. Um, PhDs are a diff- difficult ones to do, right, because they're very time limited and you can't yeah. do everything in that amount of time. So maybe it's a case of you want to run your first study quickly, so you, you, you run a study. But while you're running that first study, consider where you might go from the first study. Um, can you pre-register that in advance? And even even if you do, like the amount of mistakes I've made in a pre-registration because I haven't um, like thought about it enough. But that's again part of the learning process. Um, so yeah, that, I don't know whether that answered your question or not. But like I said, I this talk has kept me up at night because I feel <laughs> like I shouldn't be giving it because I'm from a very privileged position in parts. Well, at least you're thinking about what to do in the future if that happens. So I guess that's that's a good first step, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Andy. Uh, Andy, if I could ask just one additional question, uh, what would you say to a principal investigator who is a more senior researcher whose like entire career is based on these old non-open science practices like do you have any experience actually converting uh one of these people or what would you say to them to sort of convert them to more open science practices uh, uh, god these questions are horrible um <laughs> i don't i haven't i haven't had that directly i've um i've had a few experiences and as, as like an editor and peer reviewer where people have just downright refused to share data for papers and stuff and one one of them was um we wanted to try and as, as an editor to, to, to run their code to see what was going on and they, they just said no because they don't think data sharing is the only way to be open in science and i think it's, it's difficult for that because it's such a dogmatic view isn't it how how can you change that if that's what someone's ideal is and if they're willing to have a paper rejected on the fact they're not willing to share data how well I, I find it very difficult for me to to know personally do anything about that um but yeah I'd again it's I've not ne- we're in I think if you do open science you're kind of in a bubble aren't you and you you deal with other people who are doing open science and you you don't really come across the outside of it that that much or I I haven't but again that again that's because I I was in a privileged position to begin with because when I was doing my PhD, it was not forced upon me, but it was seen as kind of this is what we should be doing. And then I've always just seen that as moving forward. And I know that's not the same in every lab. But. All right. Thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you for humoring me and <laughs> letting me put you on the spot with that question. Um, no, it's right. So. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. We do have to move on. Um, so our next speaker is Maddie Pownell. She is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Leeds. She is also an early career researcher herself. She just got her PhD in 2022. Uh, she is also a very prolific author. Um, she's published extensively on topics such as women's health, open science practices and qualitative research, and also how to navigate open science as an early career researcher. And she is the author of a popular book entitled A Feminist Companion to Social Psychology. And today she's going to talk about how to make science more open for underrepresented scholars. So please join me in welcoming Maddie Pownell. Thank you, Maddie. Hi hey everyone, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I think I've almost got a crick in my neck from nodding so much through Andy's talk. <laughs> and I think there's going to be uh, potentially some conceptual overlap in the last talk and this talk. We could have probably tag teamed it, did it together. Um, but anyway, I'm going to be talking about how we can make science more open for underrepresented scholars or the scholars that we tend to hear less from. Um, I've tagged on a little bit to the title um, when I was putting these slides together, which is lessons from feminist psychology, because I'm going to talk, I'm kind of going to frame this conversation about how we can make science more open for different groups of people through a lens of what we can learn from feminist psychology. So I am a feminist psychologist. Um, uh, my PhD was about kind of uh, feminist approaches to women's experience during pregnancy. And since then, I've now moved to do more pedagogical research about student experience and teaching open science. And in the past few years, I've been trying to think about what those two kind of different parts of my scholarship can actually learn from one another. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you how I'm going to end. 
So in 15 minutes, I'm hoping that I'll have put the case to you that open research is valuable. So if you haven't got there yet, I think it's valuable. I'm also going to put the case that there are some methodological, epistemological and cultural battles within open research that I think are ongoing. And I still think we need to, as a collective science, figure out together. I'm going to put the case to you that I think open research has a lot to learn from feminist psychology. So I think a lot of the conversations that are happening quite recently about kind of uh, mainstream conversations about what good research looks like, what credibility looks like. I'm kind of going to tell you that th these conversations have been happening in, in feminist scholarship spaces since like the 70s. Like this is some work has been done in this area. Um, and I'm also going to kind of put the case that I think a lot of the goals of open research are very much aligned with this other kind of uh, research and literature area of um, feminist scholarship. So to get started, um, so I think it's important just to kind of provide a bit of context about what I'm talking about when I'm talking about feminist psychology or feminist scholarship. So if you're sat and if you're not a psychologist, then um, don't kind of zone out, bear with me, because this is really about kind of feminist approaches to knowledge, feminist approaches to uh, research, science, scholarship, although I'm calling it psychology. So feminist psychology means very different things to different people. So there was a, a paper that I did a few years ago with um, colleagues that was all about kind of being a feminist researcher and how we navigate open science spaces. And immediately from doing that work, one of the first conversations we had is what does it mean to be a feminist scholar? And for some people, being a feminist scholar means that their research is specifically about gender. So specifically about advocating for the experience of women and girls, for example, or trying to correct some of the distortion and damage that's been done by science um, when it tries to understand the experience of women and girls. For other people, a feminist approach to research is more broader than that. So it's not necessarily gendered. It's about questioning. It's about questioning the assumptions about how we do research, the assumptions about how science is done, how we collaborate, how accessible our work is, how we ask questions. And for me, so Alexandra Rutherford is a um, is the quote from her here. She's a feminist historian, my kind of top of my like dream dinner party guest list. And she has this quote that feminist psychology is ultimately about questioning the questions. So instead of taking for granted that there are research questions that we find interesting, a feminist approach to knowledge is about questioning why is this interesting? What does the fact that we're asking this question say about what we value, what we kind of hold true? Um, and that's kind of the approach that I take. So it's not necessarily about gender. It's about questioning what is it we're doing here? And that's wrapped up with other kind of concerns as well, such as concerned about intersectionality of experience, making sure that there's not a default person that we're speaking to, ensuring that we're always critical, that we're always inclusive, that we decolonize and that we celebrate bias rather than remove bias, which is a kind of talk in itself. We can pick that up in the panel discussion later, if you like. So. Feminist psychology, I really like this quote from Leah Warren, where she says that, um, oh, Leah Warner, where she says that feminist psychology or feminist scholarship dismantles dominant knowledge production by employing subversive methods and asking subversive questions. Now, one of my kind of first like forays into open research was at a re open research uh, kind of training camp thing a few years ago, um, where open research was presented as being subversive as being kind of troublemaking as kind of trying to challenge science as trying to push people to do better and it was really at that point that I thought actually the conversations that are happening in open research spaces that are kind of being branded as as new ways of thinking has shared an awful lot of similarities with these kind of decades worth of scholarship and thinking about feminist approaches to knowledge because what they're both in very different ways and kind of in separate ways thinking about and doing is trying to advocate for a concern for reappraising, rethinking and reconstructing. So it's kind of scratching it and starting again in terms of how we do science, how we do knowledge, how we think about power um, in our science, how we think about voice. So one of the big things that I've been advocating for um, kind of delicately over the past few years, really, is trying to think about how the goals of open research and the kind of concepts um, and goals within feminist psychology can and should speak to one another. So what speaking to one another can look like um, is asking certain questions 
about open research as a whole. So I was going to kind of consider myself like a bit of a meta scientist now. I was kind of like meta meta that I'm interested in, like the science of how meta science is done. And I think that there's some really important questions which which chimes really nicely with what Andy was talking about around how open research itself is being done. So these are the kind of feminist questions that myself and some colleagues have been thinking about over the past few years. So things like if we're going to advocate for really good, credible, robust, rigorous research, who is being included, who are our participants, who are our researchers, whose voice are we hearing, whose voice is missing, who is holding this power and which structures are governing this. Um, so this is structures such as publication structures, incentive structures, um, teaching structures about how this is how this is taught. And I think one of the big questions that has kind of I've decided is going to be my life's work trying to think about is who dis defines and who gets to define what robust science looks like. So one of the things I want to pick out right at the end is to, to try to kind of advocate for the fact that, that in saying something is good for research, saying something makes things open, that is a very, very value laden judgment. And so we need to be really careful as a community that we have a shared consensus about what the goals are. So what are the standards for rigorous research that we are aiming for? And what I'm going to kind of put to you at the end is that some of those standards are not epistemologically, so are not or methodologically appropriate for all kinds of research. And um, so this has been thought of with some really, really kind of cutting edge papers over the past few years around ethical issues with open research beyond kind of traditional views about ethics. Um, thinking about how different types of feminist data interacts or fits or doesn't fit with some open research practices. And one of the things as well, which again kind of echoes Andy's presentation really nicely, is thinking about what the kind of pushes towards open research can mean for academics who are underrepresented or who hold the least amount of power. So, for example, early career academics um, who are typically precariously employed, who typically have less power in the kind of hierarchy, hierarchy, of, higher, hang on, hierarchy of science. Um, the, what I'm kind of really interested in is through a feminist lens, trying to think about how these groups of people navigate open science, navigate open research, um, and how we can respond to some of the barriers. So usually these talks I give are just kind of like my own thoughts and feelings about open research, but I actually have, I have some data for you. Um, so I, with some colleagues, we um, surveyed a load of PhD students in the UK and asked them about open research, asked them about their experiences, about their supervisory support, how they deal with barriers, things like this. And I want to show you two quotes, um, which was a response to a free text box where we asked people about um, anything else you want to tell us, any barriers, any other thoughts and feelings. And I think that that they are um, really powerful for us to kind of think about uh, the bigger context in which some of these conversations about open research sits. So the first one, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but what was really interesting here is that um, when we asked early career academics, how do you feel about open science, open research? They talked about the need for kindness, the need for inclusivity and, a, and talked about how they one of the big barriers to engaging with open research is this idea that what if I'm found out what if I make a mistake and there was a kind of general view that there wasn't a sense that open science or that the scientific community had the appropriate levels of kindness and inclusivity and respect to be able to participate in this fully there was another quote where someone uh, a slightly different point where someone was saying Open, open science slash research is a bit daunting because it's reserved for genius researchers doing perfect experimental studies. So again, that kind of point around trying to be kind of epistemologically flexible with how strongly we, we mandate some practices. So this person was saying they went on to say, I do I do qualitative research. And so some of these um, some of the tools are, are not necessarily aligned with the kind of research that I do. Um, and I guess generally, um, one of the things that I would really like to see is a lot more of a consideration of this. So the fact that if we're going to talk about research transparency and if we're going to do everything we can to make research as transparent as possible and to make everything open and we're going to kind of encourage people to make your data open, make your code open. Um, we want to see it all. We need to at least acknowledge 
that that means that there is then a direct relationship with how vulnerable researchers are. And one of the things that I think is a is a real kind of reason why this is a feminist approach um, is that I'm really keen to make sure that we don't forget that this thing around researchers as human and that sometimes there is a disconnect between what is good for research, what's good for science um, and what is good for researchers and what that actually feels like and looks like in practice. Um, because I think that this is fine, that we have better transparency and there's a heightened vulnerability, but we need to make sure that we have a compassionate, constructive and collaborative culture that is going to catch people if they do fall. Um, so one of the things that was coming through in some of the data and also just kind of my conversations over the past few years is that I think that the one thing that we are missing as a as a collective, as a community, um, is the is knowing what to do when there are mistakes that are found or when there are errors um, or when stuff doesn't replicate. And how do we actually as a scientific community deal with that because I think we've got we've made really good progress with trying to catch those mistakes and having kind of error detection um I think one of the things that's left to do is think about how we respond to that compassionately so some of the other kind of areas to open uh, engagement with open research is this point around uh power and balance so I think that we need to acknowledge that that this is within a system of power um, I'm also going to fly the flag for broken science, just like Andy did, um, because I think that this is a, a a really kind of think slightly tongue in cheek, but I enjoy that way of talking about how um, how kind of conversations around research credibility, research credibility can be wrapped up with hostility and also in some respects academic bullying, um, and I'm kind of tr trying to make sure that we don't lose. The sense that even when we're critiquing research, even when that research might might well have errors or may well not be able to be replicated, that there is a human behind that research. And when that's an early career human and when that is a human who is underrepresented and doesn't have the kind of social currency or academic currency to be able to have resources to respond to that kind of adequately, um, then that's a that's a real concern. And I think that these are concerns that people are writing about and talking about on Twitter, but I think we need to really start taking them seriously now because we're going to lose people from science and we're going to lose people, we're going to lose talent because um, of hostility and academic bullying, or as Taylor Swift calls it, being casually cruel in the name of being honest. If you get that reference, then let's have a coffee. Um, so some other points, um, just kind of quite briefly. So I've talked about the point around kind of hostility and about we need to be able to catch people when they fall. But also, I think one of the things that, that I'd like to see a little bit more of is this idea that some of the open research tools, not all, but some of them come from the assumption of a very particular approach to knowledge. And that is typically a kind of very quantitative, very positivist approach to knowledge. So I think that there are what I like to call epistemological battlegrounds happening. So, for example, if you are doing participatory, creative, arts based, qualitative research with a community, your kind of epistemological goal, the goal of your research may not be to generalise. Therefore, kind of tools that assume the hallmarks of good research is the ability to replicate and the ability to reproduce and the ability to generalise are just not that epistemologically appropriate for the research that we're doing. So I think that there's a real tension with trying to advocate for tools and sometimes mandate tools while also um, kind of having enough flexibility to acknowledge that people engage with um, research differently and not because their research is less rigorous or less robust, but just because the ultimate goals of what they're trying to do with their studies is different from each other. So a lot of my research doesn't seek to generalise. That's not the point of it. It seeks to understand people's experiences. So just briefly, I've got the old buffet analogy as well. So snap with that one. Um, so just very, very briefly, some ways that I think we can start to move forward is I'm going to extend the metaphor a little bit. So I think that, yes, open research should be a buffet so you can pick which bits make sense. But also, if there's nothing on the buffet that makes sense to you, get a sandwich on the way home, find other ways of doing this. I think credibility can look and feel different to different researchers. I want to see a lot more wider, more inclusive ideas about what, what it means to be robust. What does good research look like and what assumptions are we coming from? And also big, big one. 
I think that we run into issues with hostility and academic bullying and abrasiveness when we have kind of we've put a lot of energy and effort into slowing down our research and we're rethinking publication structures and trying to do things more intentionally. The way that we critique each other's research is often fast and quick and responsive and mean and on Twitter. And so I really, really like this view of like slope and science, which I think is clever. Um, so trying to bring the kind of care, compassion and attention to our scholarly critique as we do to our scholarship itself. So I think that's about 15 minutes. That's everything. I appreciate I might have just given more questions than answers. Um, but thank you for listening. Wow, thank you so much. You packed so much into that talk and right. <laughs> uh, so many things to think about. Um, Again, I, I'd like to open up uh, the uh, questions to uh, others in the chat. Um, uh, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a, a question and then unmute yourself. Um, but in the meantime, I actually have a, another bit of a tricky question for you. Uh, okay. So you mentioned that um, many things that are important to uh, consider in opening up science for not only feminist researchers, early career researchers, but you also mentioned decolonizing. Uh -huh. And I wonder if you have any uh, concrete tip or tips uh, for decolonizing your research. Oh, that's a really good question. That's a really hard question. Um, I guess one of like my biggies is I think that what some people tend to do when they're faced with the challenge of like or, or when they're faced, faced with kind of challenges like decolonization or criticality is to try to kind of reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. Whereas I think that one of the most useful places to start is to engage with the decades and decades and decades of literature and scholarship that that is already being done about what it means to decolonize and what that looks like and what that feels like because I'm also really conscious that um for example the whole relationship between feminist psychology and open research that I do get the sense that there's these scholars who have been writing about this stuff for their whole career around this is how we can do it but because the, their ideas at the time weren't mainstream or weren't priorities or we weren't talking about it it's kind of been lost from history a little bit um so I think that one of the um kind of places to start with thinking about really big issues like decolonization is to kind of find and honor some of the thinking that's already been done if that makes sense like historically um because I see a lot like we're doing a lot at the moment around trying to like decolonize our curriculum and there's a tendency of some people to kind of come from it being like, my view is that this is what decolonization looks like and feels like, rather than trying to engage with this kind of, uh, with the history that's already there, if that makes sense. I don't know if that actually answered the question, although I just said, go read something. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I definitely agree with that. My question kind of came from this, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of uh, people just saying decolonize your curriculum, but uh yeah it's it's hard to think of like concrete examples for doing that it, it looks like uh Ko Komeng has a, a question if you'd like to unmute yourself uh, uh, thanks, we have time Shane. for one more yes thank you uh, thank you i was just wondering um if uh inclu increasingly including um literature you know for example your book Madi being part you know that becoming part of the curriculum as a member of a community that has been you know a, a, a female or you know uh including my books and my publications in part of the curriculum is that considered sufficiently decolonizing the curriculum no it's not <laughs> enough okay yeah i think i think that the i think that raises a really good point actually that i think that there's particularly in the curriculum, because that's kind of where my head is at the moment, there can be a tendency to think that it's a thing that happens that is then done. And I think it's a little bit with like in integrating anything, like integrating open research in this curriculum or a sen sense of belonging into the curriculum, that I think that there is, it can always be taken further. And I guess that one of the points actually that I think is useful is to work in partnership and in collaboration so for example a decolonizing the curriculum might be working with students decolonizing research might be might be intentionally and actively trying to center voices that we know are missing from psychology from the from whatever research area um and i think that that's kind of the goes hand in hand with doing the reading that i think that it's about 
acknowledging where the expertise is. Um, and it's a bit like, you know, what Andy was saying about how I'm also really aware that I've got an incredible amount of privilege because I've got, you know, I've got a, a academic contract and I'm here and I can talk and I'm white and things like that. And I think it's also about trying to be really intentional with that power and privilege and using it to, instead of trying to kind of think about kind of or advocate for this is what I think this looks like um getting the right people in the room and and um honoring what's come before as well historically great uh, thank you so much Maddie for your insights uh we do have to move on to our final speaker um there will be time for more questions in the general discussion so our final speaker today is Tetsuya Amano, who is the Deputy Director in Research at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Science at the University of Queensland in Australia. So last year, Tetsuya was at the forefront of a group of international collaborators on an extremely influential paper in PLUS Biology on the manifold costs of being a non-native English speaker in science, which is the topic of his talk today. Uh, the media about this work has been fittingly republished in multiple languages, including Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Spanish, many, many others. Um, and I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say we really appreciate you joining us today uh, or this evening from Australia, Tetsuya. So um, I'd like to uh, ask everyone to join me in welcoming Tetsuya Amano. Take it away. No worries. Thanks very much. Can you see the screen? That's right. OK, that's good. Good. So first of all, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it is a great honor to be giving this presentation for the closing keynote talk for this uh, important event about open research. So almost five years ago, we launched this project called the Translate Project to investigate consequences of language barriers in science and especially in environmental sciences. So in this presentation, I will give you an overview of our project's outcomes so far. So my background is biodiversity conservation, which is very different from uh, the background of other people here, I think. So our work inevitably focuses largely on this specific discipline, but I hope the findings are applicable to many other disciplines as well. Okay, so obviously English is now recognized as the common language of science. So why does language matter in open science in the first place? To answer this question first, <clears throat> how many languages are there in the world? <clears throat> the answer is it's about over uh, 7,000 languages. There are over 7,000 languages in the world. Next, how many native English speakers are there in the world? The answer is 380 million. So it's a lot, but a relatively small proportion of the world's population. And this actually means that 95% of the 8 billion people in the world are actually non-native English speakers. And those people from around the world use 7,000 languages to communicate. So to me, it only seems natural and absolutely necessary to consider how having so many languages among us might affect science itself, its communication and its application. So how do language barriers impact open science? In this paper published in 2016, uh, we showed that up to 36% of scientific documents on biodiversity concerns our discipline appeared to be published in languages other than English. But such non-English language scientific evidence is likely underused in the global level synthesis of evidence because it's not readily accessible. So this is the language barriers to the global synthesis of evidence. And then there's another type of language barriers where scientific evidence available only in English is not effectively used in the local application of scientific evidence, such as local decision making in countries where English is not widely spoken. <clears throat> Finally, because of the language barrier, non-native English speakers may not be able to fully contribute to the generation of scientific evidence so this is the language barrier to the generation of evidence. <clears throat> the importance of these language barriers is also well recognized in the UNESCO recommendation on open science. For example, one of the open science core values proposed here is equity and fairness, which makes sure equal access to scientific knowledge to knowledge producers and consumers, regardless of their, their language. 
And this is essentially about language barriers to evidence generation and evidence appreciation. Another core value is diversity and inclusiveness, which states that open science should embrace a diversity of knowledge and languages, which is essentially about language barriers to evidence synthesis. And finally, one of the proposed guide, guiding principles is equity of opportunities, suggesting that anyone, regardless of their language, should have an equal opportunity to access and contribute to and benefit from open science, which is exactly about language barriers to evidence generation and evidence application. So from here, I will introduce some of our works on each type of language barriers in science. <clears throat> okay, so first, let me explain language barriers to the generation of scientific evidence by non-native English speakers. Because science is now conducted largely in English, non-native English speakers can face multiple barriers when conducting different types of scientific activities in English. So in our latest, latest study, we quantified these barriers for non-native English speakers by comparing the amount of effort needed to conduct different scientific activities in English between non-native English speakers and native English speakers based on the survey with 908 environmental scientists from eight countries. And what we found was striking. When comparing native and non-native English speakers with only one publication, so it's essentially early career researcher, our survey shows that non-native English speakers need 91% more time to read each paper in English. So this means their hurdle is twice as high as that of native English speakers. Then they also need 51% more time to write each paper in English. And before they submit, they still need to ask someone to proofread their English for most of their papers. Even then, their papers are more likely to be rejected simply due to their English writing, and that frequency is 2.6 times higher in non-native English speakers compared to native English speakers. And there's also a huge difference in the frequency of language-related paper revision. Non-native English speakers are requested to revise their papers 12 times more often than native English speakers. And when preparing a oral presentation, they also need 94% more time than native English speakers. What's more, 30% of them often decide not to attend on international conferences, and half of them decide not to give an oral presentation due to English language barriers. And it's not the end of the race. As long as you are in a research career, you will face these barriers every time you do any of these scientific activities. So it's pretty clear that these disadvantages can impede the participation and career development of non-native English speakers in science, seriously impeding their contribution to the generation of scientific evidence globally. Okay, now let, uh, let's look at how language barriers might impede the synthesis of scientific evidence. First, how is non-English language science used in global evidence synthesis? This is the proportion of references cited in these eight international assessments on biodiversity by language. And not surprisingly, English language references dominate in most assessments, is on average 96% of the references cited being in English. And this is in clear contrast to the result we saw earlier that 36% of existing conservation literature was written in non-English languages. So this indicates that most of the existing non-English language science is not being used in global level evidence synthesis. So what are the consequences of ignoring non-English language science? One problem is that ignoring non-English language science can cause severe biases in the type of evidence synthesized. In healthcare, it has been shown that more statistically significant results are more likely to be published in English. This issue is known as language bias in evidence synthesis, more specifically language bias in statistical, statistical results, meaning that the nature and direction of a study's results can affect what language it is published in. For example, in this paper, we found that effect size was hugely different between English language studies and Japanese language studies, although all those studies were used in the same meta-analysis. And in this case, ignoring no English language studies would bias the conclusion of meta-analysis. 
However, a slightly different type of language bias might also exist, especially in ecology and conservation, <coughs> which is language bias in study characteristics. <coughs> For example, studies conducted on a local species might be more likely to get published in non-English language journals, as those studies would not be of high interest to international readers. And in this paper, in this paper we showed that language bias in study characteristics does exist, having serious consequences for evidence synthesis. So these blue grid cells show the distribution of English language studies testing the effectiveness of conservation interventions. And we can see that English language studies are unsurprisingly concentrated in certain countries, such as UK and the US. And there is a huge gap in the availability of scientific evidence in other parts of the world, including the most biodiverse regions, such as Latin America, Africa, and uh, Asia, Asian countries. <coughs> Now, when we searched no English language studies testing the effectiveness of conservation interventions using the same selection criteria, we found a number of relevant no English language studies in those regions with little information based on English language studies, such as Latin America, Russia, and East Asian countries. And those no English language studies often provide unique evidence on the conservation of threatened species. So this clearly indicates that there is a systematic bias in study locations and species between English language and non-English language studies. And by ignoring non-English language studies, we could lose this amount of important scientific evidence, especially for those areas and species with little or even no English language evidence. Okay, so finally, let me also briefly touch on language barriers to the local application of scientific knowledge. In this study, we identified national reports on the state of biodiversity in countries where English is not an official language and looked at the proportion of references cited in those reports by language. And we are surprised at the very high proportion of non-English language references in most reports shown in yellow and orange here. Across these 37 countries, 65% of the references cited was, on average, in a non-English language. And when we surveyed those report authors, a quarter of the report authors answered that they struggled with understanding English language literature when writing their reports. So this indicates that language barriers indeed pose a serious barrier to the uptake of scientific evidence that is available only in English. Yeah, so now that hopefully we all know language barriers can have serious consequences for open science, the question is how we can solve these problems. I'd say it's not easy at all, and we definitely need a concerted effort at every single level, from individuals to institutions and societies. And in this article, we compiled 10 simple tips for overcoming different types of language barriers in science. And I won't go into the details of each point today, but let me focus on how we can address language barriers to evidence generation by non-native English speakers. In this paper, we provided a list of actions to address language barriers to non-native English speakers that can be adopted by different actors. So many of these act actions are related to providing various types of practical, financial, and mental support to non-native English, non -native English speakers, as shown in red here. And another set of critically important actions are to distinguish the quality of science and the quality of English when assessing science and scientists, as shown in yellow here. At the moment, unfortunately, these actions are rarely adopted in the scientific community. For example, when we surveyed 736 journals in biological sciences to assess how linguistically inclusive their policies are, we found out that few journals actually provide genuine support to non-native English, non -native English, non -native English speakers. For English editing services, 41% of the journals provide no English editing support, while 58% simply direct authors to commercial services, which I would say is not genuine support. Also, only 6% and 4% have instructions to reviewers and editors, respectively, 
to explicitly distinguish the quality of science from the quality of language in submitted manuscripts. Nevertheless, a small number of journals already provide very good English editing support for non-native non English speakers. And some conferences have also recently started to provide support for non-native English speakers, such as allowing multi-language presentations or offering a mentoring system where non-native English speakers can receive support for presentation practices and preparations. So we should definitely expand such efforts to many other journals and conferences that have been doing almost nothing to date. And the most common question I seem to get when I talk about language barriers these days is whether AI can help us overcome language barriers. And I will say my answer is yes, but with some caution. Although they may not be perfect, recent AI tools such as ChatGPT, DeepL, Rightful, and so on, can provide useful and importantly free or affordable English editing services for non-native English, non English speakers. And this is particularly important in terms of achieving equity in science because, as our recent work showed here, researchers from lower income countries can't afford to use paid English editing services and are therefore disproportionately disadvantaged by language barriers. Some societies, including the British Ecological Society, have recently integrated such AI tools into their submission systems so that authors who are submitting papers can use them. So I believe this is an important step forward. But we know that rise of AI tools has also created new issues. Aside from the, the other commonly discussed issues around copyright and, and its accuracy, for example, the performance of AI tools can vary greatly among languages and is still far from sufficient in languages with low digital resources. Some tools, especially those of higher quality, are often not for free. So this may give rise to another inequality issue, as privileged researchers are more likely to be able to leverage such AI tools. So we need to keep discussing the effective and ethical use of AI tools in science, especially for open science. <clears throat> But yeah, so that basically concludes my talk today. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the collaborators for our Translate project for the huge, truly huge contribution. Uh, we, we couldn't do this uh, research without their help. So we are working on many other exciting research and solutions. So please do visit our website here. And if you're interested, contact us anytime. Let's work together to solve this important challenge in science. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tetsuya, for that very enlightening talk. And I just have to say again, I really love your concrete tips uh, for overcoming these language barriers. It looks like we have a few uh, questions already. Um, yeah. If you could just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, we. We can't hear you. I don't know if that's. OK, I guess I, I think we lost the first person. There was another person who raised their hand, but I don't see it anymore. Um, maybe they'll come back. But if I could ask uh, um, sort of another tricky question, <laughs> I guess that's my my role for this uh, uh, today. But. Um, uh, what I'm really curious to know is your sort of personal opinion of what it, do you think is the future of international science? So you mentioned uh, sort of supporting people with English as a second language in like writing English papers. But do you see the future really uh, far ahead being um, people just writing papers in multiple languages or is English the language of science and do you see that sort of continuing into the future what is your opinion on that yeah so that is really interesting question and that that is something i'm also really keen to know and i've been discussing this uh, with so many people you know in different disciplines but i'll say the science is becoming more multilingual obviously because of the uh, you know development of AI tools in the future i'm not sure how i'm, I'm not sure how far it will be but in the near future or in the future, 
it will be possible to, you know, for anyone to publish their own papers in their own languages, and then those papers can be read by anyone in any languages with the aid of AI tools. So multilingualizing the, the science and its communication is probably the way forward, I'm guessing, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to know what other people in other disciplines, and especially experts in you know, AI or that kind of things, thinks about this. But yeah, that is my, my opinion. Great, thank you so much. And um, uh, we, we do have time for one more short question if anybody has a final question for Tetsuya. Otherwise we will move on to the general discussion. I don't, oh yes. All right, thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, today. I really appreciate it. Um, now I will hand it over to Lucia, who will be moderating the general discussion with uh, the speakers. <laughs> yes, I know. Is this being recorded? Because I want to make a comment about the, <laughs> the editing services. I was thinking during your talk, um, asking for more costs to be imposed on people who are already <clears throat> limited in terms of funds seems as outrageous given how much money we give for open access fees. Because I'm not sure where the money is going. Authors do all the work. We proofread. The proofs come back. They've made a few mistakes most of the time when I have to correct back and then the manuscript is, is published. So I'm not sure where, <laughs> where all those funds are going. And I, I do imagine a world where mandatory language editing or at least some extent of support should be given as a default. Uh, no extra cost. It should be part of the process, but maybe I'm too romantic. I don't know. And um, I don't know what, what you think about that. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion. Do you think it would help? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I definitely agree. So, you know, the journals, how, how much money journals are earning, if you think about this, you know, journals should be able to give some support for free. So the support from the journal is definitely important. And also, as you said, the, there's definitely the interacting effect of language barriers and other types of barriers, especially the economic barriers. So that is another really important thing we need to think about. Yeah. Right. Um, so we administered a survey for the this uh, keynote, but we didn't have too many responses. I think it wasn't advertised there on time. But uh, from the results, I think most of us agree that one of the most important barriers for promoting more inclusivity in open research is that we have this constant pressure to publish in high impact journals, whatever that means. Uh, of course, that needs to be within a strict timeline because everyone competes with how many papers can can we publish in a year. And then there's also a lot of pressure on on progressing your career. And a lot of times the incentives for open research are not there. Um, so uh, maybe I'd like to open a discussion, see if anyone has any comments on that topic. I guess we all agree, but maybe yeah. maybe someone has an idea on what to do about it because I oh. I don't know personally. Madi, <laughs> I am muted to say I agree, but I don't have any solutions. Yeah, I guess, I guess that there's, uh, I mean, I think one of the most promising kind of movements alongside open research, at least personally for me, for the past few years, has been more like collaborative team-based science. Because um, there's been it's like so plug for fort. So fort, the framework for open and reproducible research training is a collective of people across disciplines who care about this stuff. And we tend to write like collectively write these kind of massive multi authored papers. And it's and it's kind of a we're trying to kind of promote research as a team sport rather than this whole weird competitive dog eat dog thing. Um, and I guess that kind of personally although there are like incentive structures and kind of institutional structures I have to fit with, I think participating in things that make science or, or participating in with groups of people who are doing the science that feels like the science I want to be doing, at least then that's something, you know, at least, at least then it can kind of feel like what I'm doing is meaningful and fun and collaborative and asking questions in the right way. 
Um, yes, that is thought. Um, and yeah, so I think it's a bit like one of the things that we we talk about in the paper that was about like navigating open sciences, uh, early career feminist researchers is around like, yeah, you might have a supervisor who's really anti open science and it's awful and the incentive structure is bad and 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 it, that's a thing. And I know plenty of people who have had that experience where they're like, we don't pre register what we talk about. And we were kind of advocating for like, well, there's other places of getting that fix and there's other places of having these conversations places like this there's places to have that conversation to think about what robust science looks like to learn how to do it um that's outside of the kind of uh platforms and spaces that institutions sometimes offer us directly if that makes sense so my rambling views <clears throat> yeah so i think this is really sorry that? Oh, go on, sorry, go on. Yeah, I think this is a really important but difficult topic to answer, but uh, I think it's maybe all about, uh, you know, how we evaluate, how we assess science and scientists. And essentially it's, you know, the, the essentially it's us who are evaluating science and scientists. So if we can change our own views and attitude, towards these kind of things, we might be able to, you know, make a big difference. So, yeah, obviously this is not perfect solution, but changing our own mind and attitude might be important first step. I really, can I jump in again? Sorry. I really agree with that because well, I was having this conversation with a colleague the other day where we were saying, we're changing our, sorry, we're changing our curriculum. And people were kind of saying, well, the university wants us to do X, Y, and Z. And the university is saying this. We were like, we are, the, you, like, we're the university. The university is us. And it's like, you know, as a social psychologist, people say, because I'm a social psychologist, people say society thinks and society thinks this and society culturally. And I'm like, but that's us. We're it, you know. And it's and it's funny the amount of spaces I sit in where we talk about the problem of academic bullying and we talk about inclusivity and the need for this as if like science is a thing that's happening that we're like look over there at what's happening where it's yeah I think that the last point is so important that it's it's us um so I think that there is as well as kind of trying to participate in the sidelines and just kind of side hustle your way through a PhD in a way that feels fun I think there's also um you know if there's something wrong with the incentive structure I think I think that there's space in the other's oh, power in the collective to uh articulate what that looks like and to articulate a better way forward you know i think another point that might be getting a little bit ignored is about hiring um criteria and how do you assess four star papers or first author papers i think uh, or preprints are not being recognized as much so the the um, not just the quality of the output, but the quantity of output is not just fairly in terms of uh, doing open research, because like you said, it's very slow and good quality work. You shouldn't focus on how many papers I could get in a year. It should be how many good research papers that could have a real impact could I have. And people don't talk about are you inclusive in how you do the research? No one cares. So um, a lot of lip service I see is going around. But when it comes to assessing the, the impact of your work this is not something that is being mentioned so I just want to put that out there um, in terms of even looking for PhDs or postdocs this is something that we could promote by saying look if you this is how you do research I would like to work with you so it's not just about how many papers can you get me in a year are you a good worker basically um, it should be more about that but if anyone wants to um, I see a lot of nodding heads so that's good <laughs> we agree uh, yes, I see a raised hand. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Lucia. Um, so you've mentioned the uh, metrics there in terms of how many uh, publications we generate uh, per, per year. There's also uh, how many citations we get from those outputs. Uh, so Catherine and Kath have have, um, have started a, an excellent trend here at John Moores where uh, in, in retreats, for example, for women who are looking to get promoted to read, uh, you know, they come uh, and they talk about how we can maximize on the, first of all, where we can find, you know, the metrics that are, that are perhaps not obvious to us, you know, our scopus, uh, and, um, 
citations of our work through uh, by policy developers, for example, to show that we have a wider impact beyond uh, academic uh, spheres. Uh, but those mat- metrics about um, uh, how 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 often your your outputs are are cited uh, is an interesting um, uh, caveat because uh, shortly around COVID, uh, I saw um, on Twitter, as it were, uh, some comments, a volume of comments about my work is not being cited because of my name. And I thought, surely that's not a thing. Until uh, a few years later, my papers were not being cited. Uh, and interestingly, uh, some of the, and, and I'm not claiming to be the perfect, you know, scientist with perfect experimental designs uh, and so on, but what I would find is that, um, uh, so let's say I've published a paper and, and Matt decides it because it's uh, the work that we've published is some of the earliest around soil. She cites it. But the next researchers from certain parts of the world cite Madi. Although Madi has cited me in the paper, in that paper, they'll cite her, not me and, and you know, and, and, and my uh, co-authors. And I, I just thought, what is that about? Um, I'm the last person to think it's happening because I'm a black woman. But I, I just think, you know, why why would you cite, uh, why would you not cite a primary paper? You know, if you're a good scientist, why would you overlook where the work has started? Um is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm black? Is it because my the primary author of our work at that moment, you know, was uh, uh, an African person from Nigeria? I don't know. It could be that, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because then I'll start poisoning my mindset. But, but honestly, when I saw that that the volume of discussion on 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 X to say I'm not being cited because of my name, um, it was concerning because we honestly do not want to go that, down that route, especially after the discussions around, you know, that uh, uh, Tasunya has, has indicated, for example, around um, uh, scientists from previously or currently excluded parts of the world and the hurdles that they have to go through. And then finally, when they've been published, we sort of look at the list of authors and we think, well, if if the senior person in that list of authors is not from the States or from Europe, when it's substandard work, uh, then then we we it's a concerning trend, is all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say something? Yeah, go on. I saw you nodding yeah. in Madi, so I might uh, please go ahead. Yeah. So there are already so many studies, I mean scientific evidence showing that. You know those people under underrepresented people like women, non-native English speakers, people from the global south are you know less cited, publishing less papers, and what else? You know taking more time to do those scientific activities. So there's a just huge amount of scientific evidence already showing this disadvantage. So I wonder if, for example, institutions like universities or funding agencies, you know those those organizations can explicitly consider those disadvantages when evaluating their scientists, for example, when doing the appraisal of their employees, or maybe when assessing the, you know, funding proposals, you know, we have to consider these disadvantages explicitly. So that should be included in the, you know, guidelines and so on. Um, can I just say that this is a horrible thing that, that is happening, but I, I have noticed uh, in some of my colleagues from previous years that when we use even research as an evidence base, right, we see those papers and there is like a Japanese name or a foreigner's name, whatever that is, I don't even know if they care where that comes from as long as it's a British surname or a Western sounding surname, they are perceive the evidence as to be of lower quality, of lower importance, um, which is very, very frustrating. I don't understand why, personally, but um, I think for changes like this, we should be explicitly recommending our undergraduates and our postgraduates and the people we work with to diversify their the reading, basically, and the literature that they 
that they cite and the evidence that they look for. Um, so that's one way. It's not a mandate per se, but it's just pushing people in that direction because uh, they may not be aware of it. And if they if they are, then we need to have a little kind fight with them and push them on their on their views. So um, that's that's my that's my solution, I guess. But I don't know if anyone else has any other ideas on how we can solve issues like this. So double brand review is definitely one easy option for journals to do that. But there are, of course, many other solutions, I think. I think that that might be all we have time for. I hope that's okay, Rajan and Lukia. I Just yes. to point out that, um, uh, is it Kirsty had put in a link, Kirsten's apologies, had put in a link to DORA, which some universities that are in attendance today, it's worth looking at that link where there are, you know, uh, discussions. And they also have a new um, a resource called Reformscape, where you can actually search and see universities that have implemented different things regarding DORA, which is the Declaration on Research Assessment. So do have a look at that. Um, we have come to the end of, of today um, and also the end of Open Research Week 2024. So hopefully this has given everybody a lot to, to think about. Um, just again, we want to thank um, Rashan and Lukia for uh, facilitating this, also bringing together the speakers today, um, Andy, Maddie, Tetsuya, and also coming for, coming for opening. We cannot do these weeks without um, you guys giving your time and your expertise. Um, and you've really given me so much to think about. I was writing down lots of notes and thinking about who have we included, who we haven't included, and what topics that we should be thinking about when we run this again. Um, to steal Andy's open science buffet. That's kind of what we try to do for this week is have different things um, that, that people can enjoy. So I was thinking, hopefully you've tried some stuff and maybe you like some things, maybe you're gonna come back. And if you didn't like anything to steal Maddie's idea of leave us a feedback sandwich on the way out. Uh, you can tell us, you know, some things that uh, you might want to see. But um, after this uh, session, you'll get like a, a link that will have a survey in that. So um, please share, you know, what we can do better, what you enjoyed, um, events you'd like to see and other things in the future. I think, Judith, you just wanted to say something really quickly about the week as a whole, if that's if you people have yes. like 30 more seconds. Yes. Just really quickly. <laughs> Um, this year, the Open Research team moved out of the Northwest and we welcome the University of Essex to the team. And it's great to have you on board. And we've really has helped make uh, Open Research 2024 really successful. I want to thank Catherine for making all the sessions, to, uh, making sure they take place and making everyone feel so welcome. And Kath, who has been on LinkedIn and Twitter all week and will be publishing our blog. Thank you so much. We couldn't do this week without the generosity of our speakers and facilitators, all of them for this week. So thank you very much to all of you. And finally, of course, to say thank you to our audience and colleagues who sign up and log on. Thanks very much. See you in 2025.